bald eagles in the Channel Islands of California, including Channel Islands National Park, were once extirpated from the area by habitat changes caused by settlers and contamination of the environment by pesticides. Thanks to decades long restoration efforts, bald eagles have once again established a firm presence in that area. In 1987, only 27 California condors remained alive in the entire world. They were a species on the absolute brink of extinction. Today, thanks to the work of dedicated conservationists and public support, the population of California condors has rebounded to more than 500 individuals. While this number represents a success, it also underscores that condors have a long way to go before they are no longer threatened with extinction. Two bird species, the bald eagle and the California condor, represent stories of hardship and success in an era of great human impact on the planet. Hi, everyone. This is Mike Fitz, your resident naturalist with explore.org, the world's largest live nature cam network. Today, we're going to focus on bald eagles in the Channel Islands area, as well as California condors on the mainland for similar and for different reasons. Condors face a continued threat from lead poisoning and bald eagles in the Channel Islands live in an ecosystem with high levels of DDT contamination. We have two interviews to share to help us learn more about these issues and the strides we've collectively made to combat them. The interviews are recorded, but if you have questions, I'm here live right now to try to answer them. So you can drop those in the comments and a helpful moderator from Explore.org will send those in my directions. Uh, we'll try to answer a few later on in the broadcast. To begin though, let's talk about eagles. On Santa Cruz Island in Channel Islands National Park, the Sauces territory is occupied by a male eagle numbered A40, otherwise known as Jack, and a female numbered A48, otherwise known as Audacity. These birds exemplify the success of bald eagle restoration on the Channel Islands and some of the challenges that eagles face as they work to survive and reproduce. To help us learn more about bald eagles and the saga of the sauce's nest, I spoke with Dr. Peter Sharp, a research ecologist with the Institute for Wildlife Studies. That's a nonprofit that gathers information to maintain biodiversity and viable populations of all species and enhance our understanding of the animals that we share the world. Given that the pair of eagles at the sauce's nest have had seven eggs break this year, I was curious to know if the legacy of DDT contamination in the Channel Islands region played any role in their nesting difficulties. As you'll hear from Dr. Sharp, he talks about how the remnants of DDT remain quite harmful for animals, but he also can ensure the egg breakage at the sauce's nest. Since Dr. Sharp has decades of experience working on eagle restoration in that area, I thought he'd be a good person to ask about it. Here's our conversation. Yeah, great to see you once again, and, and thanks for taking the time out of your day to join us. It's my pleasure. For me, bald eagles, they seem to represent this, this dichotomy, uh, in, at least in my mind. They're no longer considered a threatened or endangered species in the United States. However, they still experience many challenges caused by people. Uh, for eagles and other wildlife in the Channel Islands region, the legacy of DDT contamination really continues to affect them. Uh, perhaps uh, a half million barrels of DDT contaminated sludge uh, was dumped by a chemical company in the ocean near Catalina Island. And I wanted to talk to you about how that pollution might relate to what we've been seeing on the sauce's nest this year. You know, we have, uh, you know, eagles, in the Channel Islands, establishing nesting territories, um, and they've been doing so uh, and nesting successfully on the islands uh, for a couple of decades now after restoration efforts began. Um, and the long-term effects, though, of DDT continue to impact the birds. Uh, that that's a, a chemical that breaks down into another chemical, DDE, which can have and, and remain in the environment for decades at least. Uh, and contamination results in, in broken eggs at many nests. Uh, so after it became clear that some eagles were laying eggs with particularly fragile shells during sort of those initial restoration efforts, what steps were necessary to give the birds a, a fighting chance at reproductive success? Well, we had to start removing all the eggs from the nests starting in the late 1980s. Um, our first breeding attempts by the, the reintroduced bald eagles uh, all failed. 
we were able to get into the nest and collect some of the egg remains uh, to look for contaminants and found that they, they had extremely high levels of DDE in them, which uh, impacts the way that the, the females lay down the eggshells, uh, generally making them more porous, larger pores, so that they lose water too quickly. Um, they should lose uh, you know, X amount over their whole 35 day incubation period. And we were finding that they lost that in just a few days of incubation on the islands. So we started taking the eggs, we'd put artificial eggs in the nest and uh, the adults would continue to sit on those eggs while we uh, incubated the, the real eggs in incubators and then brought any chicks that hatched from those or that the San Francisco Zoo produced foster those back into the nests and the adults took it from there. But it was a lot of work just to basically keep the birds nesting and having some success. And we did that on Catalina through 2008. So it's only been the last 15 years or so that the birds have been breeding on their own entirely. And thinking of the sauces nest in particular, uh, if I remember right, the uh, both the male and the female of that nest are, are products of sort of like that um, that effort where you had to remove an egg, and and um, so they maybe were hatched in captivity or transported back to the nest. Is that correct? Um, those two birds, I mean, um, they were part of our restoration efforts on Santa Cruz Island that started in two thousand and two. So they okay. are both uh, birds that were released on the islands as uh, about three month old birds. Uh, so we had these release towers. We would put uh, about seven or eight week old birds in these towers, uh, feed them some fish. And when they were ready to fly, we'd open the front doors on the towers and they would just start exploring the islands. So those birds are the result of uh, releases, not the removal of eggs and, and fostering. I see. Okay, thanks for clearing that up in, in yeah. my brain. And, and this pair, the sauces pair, they uh, produced seven eggs so far this year. And we're talking right now, it's early March. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, and the, the first six eggs broke. Uh, they've laid an additional seventh egg, which they've been incubating over the last Few days at least so there's hope yeah. that maybe this this one has shells that are strong enough to um to to hold up during the incubation process and and they've had success in the past they've successfully fledged young before and they've also had similarly unfortunate years uh and you were you mentioned to me um in our, some of our correspondence before um our interview here that like in 2017 the female egg uh, the female eagle on the sauce's nest laid eight eggs and all of which broke so how would you be able to determine whether you know the DDE con uh, contamination contributed to the nesting difficulties this year or in the past? We would have to get the eggs and um, look at the co contents. You can't really you can't measure broken eggshells for for DDE. It's all in the uh, in the egg contents. Okay. So um, because we're not removing eggs for artificial incubation, that would be very hard to do now. Um, so I, I don't think it's DDE because of how quickly they're breaking. Um, the breaking of the eggs due to DDE, I think would have been over weeks, not hours or days, uh, as the eggs dehydrated. I don't think it made their eggs that fragile that, you know, just touching them would, would break them. So I really think with the sauces female that it's more of a maybe a hormonal problem with that particular female. I, I don't think it's a diet. I don't think it's genetic because I don't think she'd have any successful eggs if it was a genetic problem. Um, the female previous to her had no issues with eggs. The females on either side and territories on either side <laughs> have no issues with their eggs. So I think it's a, a problem particular to this one eagle. And there's really no way without capturing her and doing studies to figure out what that might be. And we wouldn't want to do that to her. Okay. Yeah, that's very interesting. And actually that, you know, was my follow-up question. You know, there's been speculation in the chats on explore.org that there's something maybe a little bit different about this female eagle. 
you know, some people have suggested it's genetics, but you mentioned hormones as well. So um, that that seems to be maybe your educated guess at this point that there there could be something else going on with with that female. Yeah, I I I don't think this particular problem is contaminants. Although we do know that the birds are picking up contaminants still, um, but I don't think with this particular bird that's the issue unless it was something during her early development so she has been eating channel islands food since you know she was eight or nine weeks old so whether that could have done something to her her development i i don't know but it's not something that we see in any other birds that have you know been raised under the same situation so it's really <laughs> difficult to say what her problem is. Yeah, a lot of uncertainty seems to exist uh, in this situation. Uh, but we know that there's still a lot of DDE in the environment in the Channel Islands region. Uh, so I wanted, I don't know if this is, uh, you know, an area of your expertise or not, but can you just speak in general about how, you know, uh, the lingering effects of, of DDT uh, affect other animals besides birds, including like marine mammals? Um, the exact, I mean, it's hard to study the, the effects because you can't really do a lab oriented project with, you know, the marine mammals, the bald eagles, the peregrine falcons. Um, it's thought that DDE probably has some neurological effects in, in marine mammals. Um, it could impact their breeding, could impact their health, their immune system. So make them more susceptible to to disease. Um, DDE is stored in fat. So the marine mammals are a, are a good reservoir for it. You know, they eat the fish and it sort of uh, gets stored in their fat. And then other animals that might feed on a dead marine mammal get a larger dose of DDE than they would be getting from, you know, just eating fish. Um, we did have one eagle back in the, I think it was in the 1980s, maybe early 90s, that um, we do think died of DDE poisoning. Um, she may have been starving and just uh, released a whole bunch of DDE into her body uh, by using up her fat. But she had very high levels of DDE when uh, they did a necropsy on her. <laughs> so it really depends on where you're feeding in the food chain, I think, on where, how DDE might affect the organism. Okay. Um, I don't think it probably affects the fish too much because they, they have relatively low levels. But as you move up the food chain um, and it gets more concentrated in, in the animal, uh, then we could start seeing, you know, the, uh, the effects on reproduction, uh, immune system, et cetera. And do, do we have any idea how long like a DDE will linger in the Channel Islands region? It seems like, you know, there's a lot out there on the bottom of the ocean and that stuff eventually can, can leak, leach into the sediments or maybe get stirred up by ocean currents um, and upwelling water, things like that. So do you have any idea how long it might, might affect, let's say, even in a best case scenario where it's not, there's not like a huge, um, you know, a pool of, of contamination for it to, to kind of draw into the system yeah the the dde um seems to be expanding throughout the southern california bite and then um sort of up the the coast towards central california you know it gets attached to sediment that gets moved about by the currents and you know uh, runoff from the land might cause uh, more movement of the sediment around and um it's you know, it's deep in the ocean, on the ocean floor and a lot of the areas where it was dumped. Uh, there's no light, there's very little oxygen, so it's even more stable in, in that type of environment. If it's on the soil in the sun, it breaks down pretty quickly, but it could be, you know, decades before it breaks down where there's little light or, or oxygen. And given the challenges that the eagles at the sauce's nest have experienced um, this year uh, you know they've they've sort of persevered through similar challenges in the past as a couple but what do you think the future holds for them 
Um, as long as they are successful um, at, at raising a chick every two to three years, uh, I think they'll stick together. Um, if it comes to the point where they're just not being successful at all, um, then there is a tendency for eagles to basically get a divorce <laughs> and and go and find a, another mate because um, it, it doesn't make sense for them biologically to just hold on to a mate that's not helping them uh, have offspring. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, uh, it's, uh, the, the, fam the family issues that eagles experience uh, sometimes aren't that, I guess, aren't that different than people, right? <laughs> and uh, one final question for you, Peter. Uh, what can we do to help ensure that the restoration of bald eagle populations in the Channel Islands and elsewhere is, is successful? And how can we help these birds, uh, no matter where we live, around the world or in North America? Um, well, you can, you know, support our projects, Explore and um, Institute for Wildlife Studies. Um, you can, you know, do your part in trying not to contaminate the environment, um, you know, with plastics, with any chemicals generally. We just often don't know what impact chemicals that we use on a daily basis might have, you know, down the line. Um, and then it's not as much of an issue on the islands, but in other areas, uh, you know, just having habitat for the birds to use. You know, we don't have a lot of people on the Channel Islands that are impacting where the birds can nest, but on mainland areas, lakes, rivers, um, it's good to have some, some trees that are not directly impacted by people living under them or camping under them or, um, just giving them some space. Yeah, wildlife, they they often just want to be left alone. So I think that's, that's really great advice. <laughs> right. so, uh, give, them, give them space when you have that that opportunity. Um, and, and Peter, it's been it's been fun to speak with you and great to speak with you uh, once again. So thanks so much for uh, for being here and sharing your knowledge about uh, bald eagles. And thanks for your work uh, over over time to to help ensure that we have bald eagles in the Channel Islands and elsewhere. All right, thank you. The eagles on the sauces territory represent stories of loss and hardship, and as well as uh, perseverance and resilience in the face of challenge and difficulty. Uh, as you heard Dr. Sharp talk about, uh, you know, DDE contamination is still an issue of that area of the nation, uh, even though DDT manufacturing has been banned in the United States since 1972. It's still there though, causing harm to birds, marine mammals, and even people. But I do want to thank Dr. Sharp again for joining me. You can find out more about the work that he does at the Institute for Wildlife Studies and his colleagues by going to their website. That's iws.org. And if you want to watch any of our eagle nest cams, just go to explore.org slash eagles. And you can take a look at the sauces nest, which I uh, can gladly say right and they seem to be doing well uh, right now. We did have uh, questions come in about eagles during the interview uh, with uh, Dr. Sharp, and somebody was wondering what is uh, the half-life uh, for something like DDE to disappear. And uh, I'm not a chemist, uh, so I don't, I don't know for sure, but I did a quick search while we were playing that interview, and it seemed like uh, the basic information I could gather is it depends on the environment. If it's in the soil, if it's exposed to sun, it's going to break down quicker, but it can still last something like 20 years or so. Uh, but if it's in water, especially if it's um, in cold water where it's not exposed to sunlight, then it can last much, much longer, some maybe over 100 years or 150 years or so. So I think there's a, quite a bit of uncertainty in there depending on what type of environment it's in, but it can last a long time. So there's still plenty of it out there in the environment, unfortunately. And uh, somebody else is wondering about the sauce's nest in particular and the behavior of the eagles there. Uh, this person writes, I noticed that she, meaning uh, the female bird, Audacity, does tend to run a little hot and she pants a lot more than other eagles. I wonder if that could contribute to something with the eggshells. 
You know, I, I'm not sure. Uh, eagles are, and, and birds just in general, are very good at, um, at regulating their temperature when they need to, regulating the temperatures of their eggs. We'll see in different habitats from time to time, if, you know, if it's a really hot day, then the birds might not necessarily sit on the egg, but they'll shade the egg with their wings or with their bodies. Um, and Audacity has, has successfully uh, raised many chicks in the past. So uh, there might be something else going on rather than just like her overall body temperature itself. But again, I don't know for sure. Uh, there's a lot we can learn by watching the Eagle cameras very closely. And I know some of our partners, like the Institute for Wildlife Studies and um, the the Raptor Resource Project, uh, they they talk all the time about how it's so important to um, to watch the eagles closely because we can learn so much about their behavior that is very difficult to do if we're standing on the ground at a distance with binoculars. So use your own eagle eyes to make those important observations. We do have a few other questions uh, here, and I'll answer one just quickly because this helps us transition to our next interview. And this one is about condors. Somebody wrote in, I have a question about the weather at the Condor Sanctuary. Does it usually snow there in winter? And as far as I know, it doesn't. I'm not from California. I actually live in Maine where it does snow a lot. But at the Condor Sanctuary, sort of like in the Big Sur area of California, I don't think it snows at that elevation very often. So it's been an unusual winter. The condors are able to adapt and endure those different conditions in even cold weather. I mean, there are some that live in Zion National Park in the Grand Canyon area where it can get, uh, you know, much colder than typically it does in, in coastal California. So they can endure that. But as we think about California condors, uh, the birds, uh, you know, are they face a lot of different types of threats um, imposed by people, especially like chemical contamination is, is, is just one of them. And one of the biggest lingering threats to condors is lead poisoning. Most wild condors have levels of lead in their blood that exceeds safe levels in human children. Some condors have been documented with blood lead levels at concentrations high enough to potentially kill a person. Lead exposure is a continued barrier to their recovery. And to help us learn more about the effects of lead on condors and the promising steps that we can take to eliminate this threat, I spoke with Dr. Joe Burnett, the Condor Program Man Manager and Senior Wildlife Biologist with the Ventana Wildlife Society. That is a nonprofit dedicated to conserve native wildlife and their habitats through science, education, and collaboration. In the 1990s, Joe helped coordinate the first releases of captive condors into the wild of Central California. And here is our conversation. Joe, it's uh, great to speak with you once again, and thanks for taking the time out of your day to talk condors with us. Hey, thanks for having me back, Mike. Always a pleasure to, to work with you guys and talk condors. Yeah, we've had a, a couple of conversations about condors and their biology and the recovery and the growth of a population since sort of like that population's nadir in the 1980s. But today I really want to kind of focus on one specific aspect of condor recovery and that has to do with, um, with lead in the environment. Uh, Maybe I should start with just a basic question. Why is lead exposure so harmful to condors? Um, it's the same case for humans. It's it's severely toxic. Um, there really is no acceptable level of lead in any kind of biological life form. It, it's extremely toxic. It's a neurotoxin, and it has very detrimental effects. And obviously, at acute levels, it it's equals death. You know, so for condors being a very resilient uh, scavenger. Obviously, they're able to digest really harmful, bat naturally occurring bacteria. Um, lead is is extremely toxic to them, as it is most most life on Earth. And um, yeah, they're no exception there. So they are particularly sensitive to it. And we've in the United States, we've removed lead from things like paint, gasoline, and that's really reduced um, you know lead exposure in in people. So how are condors uh, you know continuously exposed to lead? So condors are scavengers, obligate scavengers. They they navigate the landscape looking for dead animals. And any of those animals that have been shot with lead bullets, uh, lead bullets are a softer metal. And when they hit a carcass, they tend to fragment. And those fragments can be ingested by condors out scavenging on the landscape and they find a carcass. And not only that, when they find a carcass, they tend to go find the path of least resistance and they'll actually go in where the bullet wound is 
and where most of the metal fragments can be. And any one of those fragments, a fingernail clipping size of lead, if ingested by the condor, can either make them extremely sick or even kill them. And when you're looking at condors in the wild, um, what symptoms might they show if like a condor is experiencing lead poisoning? Yeah, what we see is like what you would typically expect with any sick animal, they get very lethargic and condors are ruled by a hierarchy. And so with a real dominant bird, you'll notice younger birds in the pecking order immediately beating up on them, him or her. Uh, and so that's a nut, that's a, honestly, probably one of the best signs we have because condors will mask illness to protect their status. And they won't, and by the time they start showing us clinical signs, it's usually not a good, it's not a good outcome. Um, it's rare that we're able to save birds like that, that, that get that sick. Um, and again, it's a huge challenge for the veterinarians. You know, we work with uh, closely with zoos that have state of the art vet hospital, veterinarian treatment hospitals that we can take the birds to. But even with all of that, Lead is so toxic that it it many of these birds can't be brought once they kind of gotten to the brink. There are you know uh, examples of uh, you know condors recovering from lead poisoning, thankfully, and a recent one that I want to talk about, and I found this story um, interesting for a variety of ways. This is uh, maybe the story of number one seven one, who's nicknamed Traveler, and when I learned about her story, it seemed both kind of like typical for maybe a condor's experience with lead and then also surprising too. We'll get to kind of both of those aspects of it. Uh, so 171 Traveler, uh, she was captured, she was treated for lead poisoning and then she was allowed to recover in captivity and then she's uh, back in the wild thankfully right now. Uh, but let's start maybe at the beginning of that process. What had to be done to assess Traveler's health when she was first suspected of suffering from lead poisoning? Yeah, it was very clear to us something was off. Again, she's a very dominant female. She's 20 plus years old. She's one of the elder birds in the flock, one of the leaders, <coughs> excuse me. And she began, uh, was acting very lethargic. And she was at an area where we typically don't see her over near the Pinnacles release site. And they had biologists in place that informed us they were seeing this odd behavior with this dominant female. And we asked him to trap her right away. We felt like there was something going on. And again, once we trapped her, uh, we sent our crew came over, we assessed it, we grabbed her and we knew something that she needed to get into treatment right away. And we drove her down to transport her down to Los Angeles zoo or at first, I'm sorry, we transferred her first up to Oakland zoo to get an initial, um, assessment of how bad, you know, whether it was superficial or was this something more severe? Oakland Zoo's vet staff quickly realized this bird was in a severe state. So we emergency flew her via Lighthawk. Um, some volunteer pilots flew her on emergency flight from Oakland Zoo to LA Zoo, where their facility has more, um, they can treat more so the severe, the birds that are very severe. Um, and they have a, a little bit more um, a capability down there. So we got her in the best hands we could. And she was admitted and uh, that's when the treatment starts. They basically start to assess what is what is causing this, which they figured out very quickly was lead poisoning. And does she still have lead fragments in her di di excuse me, digestive tract? And they determined that as well. So the challenge became, we have this very severely sick bird who still has the poison inside her, this lead poison. How do we safely get her, get that lead out without killing her in the process? And so that's why LA Zoo was chosen as the spot. They've done the surgery before and they went in and surgically removed the lead. Um, they felt like she was borderline strong enough to handle the surgery. And fortunately she came through, but it was a very, very close call. And is that, that level of intervention typical for condors and maybe suffering from lead poisoning, like the surgery? Uh, for example, or is there maybe something less invasive that you can do in cases where it's not as severe? Yeah. So a lot of times birds come in, they've been exposed to lead. We can, we test their blood and we can see this very high level exposure, but the, whatever lead they ingested either passed or they regurgitated it up, it's no longer in their system and they're still, but there's residual effects. So what we do in those cases, Oakland Zoo's vets would chelate the bird. They would inject it with calcium EDTA, which helps uh, the bird basically shed the lead from its system. 
and it allows them to excrete the, the lead that's in their blood. Um, and it helps bring down their lead level quicker. So the, uh, that's like a more introductory, like intermediate level treatment. 171 was the a classic case study of the most extreme borderline. Most birds that go through what she did do not make it. So she was an anomaly and it was not only an anomaly, but it was a very severe case. And as a biologist, having worked with these birds so many years, you know, it's unfortunate when we bring a bird like in like that, because I have to get my expectations. I have to keep them very realistic because I've been disappointed so many times. Mm -hmm. And so that's why her story is so amazing. And uh, the fact that she is a leader in the flock and she, you know, it's a miracle that she's alive, put it that way. She, she got the uh, kitchen sink thrown at her in terms of lead poisoning and, um, Again, it just shows you just how amazingly strong these birds are, you know, just their resiliency, their um, will to live, and just, you know, their why we need to keep fighting to save them. And how long was her recovery overall? Um, it was approximately six months. So that surgery is pretty invasive. And she, as part of the lead poison, they lose weight. It shuts down the basics of your digestive system for a condor that from the crop, which moves is the storage center of their food before they push it down into their stomach. And then their stomach also freezes up. So when we find birds, they're basically starving to death. They're full. They have a full stomach, but they can't imagine how frustrating that is. You're, you're starving as a condor. You're trying to drink water, you're trying to eat food, but your body or those involuntary muscles have shut down. So we find these birds with full crops, and it's usually pretty putrid because it's been in there, hasn't been able to move. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yet they've lost all this weight and then they're very thin. And like any animal, you can only use a, so much percentage of weight before there's a point of no return in recovery. And the same would be for humans. If you get too thin, you can't come back. And so she was right on that cusp. She was right at that cusp. So that's why she was right on an edge this entire the decision to do surgery was a tough one for the zoo folks because they didn't know if she could make it through. So they, she was so low in weight. They didn't know if she had enough strength to make it and endure that surgery. So it was a real big risk, but we also knew if we didn't do the surgery, she pretty much was a dead bird walking. So it was, um, really unfortunate situation to be in. And we work with these incredible partners, LA zoo, Oakland zoo that are really the unsung heroes here that, um, you know, they're, they're right on the front lines. You know, we are on the front lines of actually dealing with the birds in the field, but they're on the front lines of treating these birds. And it's, it's a tough job. I mean, they're, they're working miracles. So it's, uh, and, and unfortunately I have to say this was a miracle. Most times, nine out of 10 times, the birds die in this situation. Yeah, that's a, an amazing part of her story. I mean, again, the lead exposure is kind of like the typical thing that condors go through, but her, uh, the level of lead exposure for her and her recovery is is really amazing and maybe a bit more atypical than normal. And there's another aspect of her story I thought that was atypical as well. Um, and I wanted to ask you about this as well, because um, 171, she's she's paired with a male, uh, number 209, who's nicknamed Shadow. So we have Traveler and um, her partner. Uh, uh, yeah, so we have Traveler and her partner Shadow. And Shadow was seen, um, and, and Traveler is seen associating uh, with an unmarked first year juvenile condor recently. And I've seen some speculation about whether that juvenile could be the offspring of Shadow and Traveler. And I wanted to ask your opinion on that. What do you, what do you think is going on there? Yeah, that, that was probably the most amazing um, story that's come out of this. Obviously 171 surviving and being re-released was pretty spectacular in itself. Um, before she went in for lead poisoning, she was nesting with Shadow 209. Uh, they had a nest and anytime a bird goes into treatment mid nesting, it's really hard for the other, uh, the, the one left behind out in the field to tend and rear and be successful. And that nest, they were nesting in a very remote area. We never actually could find their nest. It was such an, a wild, I mean, these birds are so wild that they're, they're, they're in places that are just off the grid. Even with all the technology we have, we could not find that nest. And we had just assumed it failed. We're like one bird can't do it on their own. And the backstory for 209, by the way, for Shadow is he is the most dominant bird in the flock. He's the king of the hill. Okay. Um, and she's paired, obviously she's paired with the big, the big guy. And um, we know he's, we know he's as, as strong as they get. And so we re-release her and 
we had assumed that nest had failed and not too long within a month after that, we noticed uh, seeing 209 and 171 hanging out like they normally do, but one of them was never around. I mean, they would be together briefly and the other one was off somewhere. And what we found out later was it was most likely they were tending to a chick and that 209 actually kept this chick alive. And just um, at the beginning of this month in early February, we saw 171 via the Explore cam, the Explore.org cam, um, the live streaming cam that everyone loves to tune into. We spotted her with this untagged wild chick neck nuzzling. They were nuzzling each other, which Connors don't do that with any other bird, especially adults, unless it's their chick. So it's outside of, we didn't see her feed the chick, but it's the next best thing. So it's like 95%. And we won't fully know for sure until we do a DNA blood test, obviously, what, um, when we catch the bird and put a tags on it. Uh, but it's very, very likely that uh, 209 held down the fort. So we had this double miracle. We had her survive and then her male step up above and beyond and somehow keep this chick alive and now come full circle. They're, they're sitting there right in front of us on the cam. And I was up there that day live, you know, out in the field and witnessed it. And it, you know, it just, I had to pinch myself. It was unbelievable. You can't write this stuff yeah, up. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not. It's, it sounds like an amazing, uh, you know, part of the story. And uh, I, yeah, it's, it's something completely unexpected. And, 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 you know, it doesn't sound like you had a choice, though. It sounds like, you know, Traveler's, um, you know, level of, of, of lead poisoning was just so high that she had to be treated. But I am wondering, though, in hindsight, would you have taken the same steps if you had known that Traveler and Shadow were raising a chick? Did you have a choice in that situation at all? Well, our protocol is the bird, the adult comes first um, because we look at it, it, it'd be unfortunate if the chick did die, but as an adult breeder, they're contributing and reproducing for the flock. So our, our priority is to take care of them. And again, it was hypothetical at that point, whether the chick was actually still alive. So that's what makes this even more amazing. But at the end of the day, we have to protect these older birds and preserve so they can live to fight another day and breed again, right? So it's um, it's unfortunate we don't like to be in that situation. If in any situation we can do both and say both, we will. Like we've had, it happened over at Pinnacles not too long ago. We had a same similar situation where the one of the pair had to get pulled out. We knew there was a chick and we went in and evacuated the chick and brought it into captivity, raised it in captivity and then re-released it at one of our release sites. And so that, you know, that, that's actually what happened with the Nico. It wasn't from a right. lead. It was from her, her dad was lost in the Dolan fire. Redwood queen was left to raise the chick. And this other, um, male came in to try and take over the territory, attacked a Nico, that whole drama. <laughs> and we evacuated her and we've done similar situations because of lead taking out one of the pair and helped out and made sure that ensured that chick survival. And that makes that makes a lot of sense too, if, if, especially when you're considering the the knowledge that these long lived birds hold. You know, if you're a 20, 25 year old bird or older, yeah. then you, then you know you're going to be passing on knowledge to your offspring and to other members of the flock for potentially for years to come. So, you know, losing elders out of these populations can be um, you know very detrimental to them overall. Yeah, it's hard. To, yeah, it's hard to calculate the the impact when we lose these that tribal knowledge that some of these birds carry. There is, I think, some some uh, reason for hope, especially with condors uh, and and lead poisoning. Um, you know, when you're looking at California specifically, California law now requires non lead ammunition for all hunting. Uh, so, how do you expect this will aid in the recovery of condors uh, in California? Yeah, it's uh, put in place a law that basically it requires non-lead to be used. And again, we know based on our data and our intensive research, we know the source is no doubt uh, lead ammunition. So this basically gets to the point source. And again, this is, uh, we're trying to work, we're partnering with hunters and ranchers that, you know, folks that are out, um, you know, doing the right thing. They're out, you know, following the laws and hunting within the laws. This isn't like any, by any means an anti-hunting thing. It's just basically, there is a, a bullet out there that you can use that is much more wildlife friendly. You know, in any hunter rancher you talk to, they're all conservationists at heart and they want to protect those areas where they hunt. 
And it's really just having that conversation. And then our group, Ventana Wildlife Society, we also provide free non-land ammu- ammunition, a free box to hunters and ranchers that are, are in the condor range. And uh, we've been doing that since 2012, before the actual law went into effect in 2019. And uh, we do, we knew it's going to be, it's going to take time. You know, it could take five to 10 years for this full switch to happen. And um, it, there was some gray area between folks knowing the difference between hunting big game and, and say a rancher doing varmint control on his ranch. That in 2019 was also cleared up. And we think that will also have a huge impact on reducing the number of um, lead deaths. And uh, that's really the goal. It's really uh, working with hunters and ranchers and making them part of the solution. And what's great is we've had really great um, interactions and it's, you know, it's, again, it's all about protecting these beautiful areas and the animals in them, you know, and they're, they're, that's something we all share, right? Absolutely. And, uh, and you touched on this too in your last answer, but I'm wondering, uh, is it a little too early to see the positive effect of that law on condor health overall? Yeah, um, we think so because it's a demographic shift and it's, there's a lot of, it, you know, it's a lot of like, um, yeah, demographic type uh, details in there that we know need to take time to shift. And, and again, with the pandemic, we had real limited availability, um, like a lot of supply chains we saw, whether it was, you know, during the pandemic, it was pretty much everything. And it actually impacted um, ammunition as well. So the manufacturing side of, of it didn't time well with the ban. And so we're now just starting to see that market turn around. We're starting to see more availability, but it's still to get that engine going again and getting the, the availability out there. It's been slower than we anticipated. So yeah, again, that was, that's been a big limit. The pan timing of the pandemic obviously was bad on many fronts, but it definitely didn't help us with our non-lead efforts because we, we literally couldn't find non-lead to give people and hunters and ranchers that wanted to do the right thing couldn't even find it. So that's fortunately changing. That shift is happening and uh, we're working closely. And we also just work on if we can find a source of non-lead and we, we just let all of our hunter and rancher contacts know about it. Go, hey, this this company's actually got a supply of non-lead ammo in these calibers. Please go check it out. And, you know, we get really great response. And my final question for you is, how can people help sustain condors in the wild? I think you have some pretty good ideas, uh, especially after working, you know, with condors for several decades. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, thinking of condors as part of the ecosystem, obviously. And again, protecting the areas that by helping and um, advocating to protect these wi- these important wide open spaces we have, not only for condors, but for all wildlife, they need these, these protected areas. Obviously advocating for the use of non-lead with any family members or friends that actually hunt. Um, that's a huge thing you can do. And um, other, you know, condors have other threats, you know, that we always talk about with the oceans, with trash and trash in general, you know, a real, real basic thing you can do to help not only condors, everything is just, you know, if you go somewhere, pick up the trash, never leave trash behind, leave it as pretty as you saw it. Right. Um, little, it's the little things, honestly, that, that really make a huge impact. And it's not only for condors, it's, and it's really thinking of it as a system, you know, condors live in this system. They have a role, they have a role that's really important. You know, they're nature's cleanup crew, but that role benefits all the other animals in that life cycle. So um, thinking of that interconnectedness and that even picking up that little piece of trash might seem trivial, but it has a huge impact in the cycle of things, right? Yeah, that's a great, great point. Um, and, uh, you know, learning more about condors and their plight, especially with, with lead and everything else, it's made me think about some of the choices that I've made in my life, not only consumer choices, but things that I did in the past too. Uh, I used to buy and use lead split shot sinkers when I went fishing as a kid. And, you know, if, if you've never seen those, they're basically just like a little ball of metal. They have like a, an opening in them, like Pac-Man's mouth. You just kind of, uh, you can bite down on them. That's what we did. We bit down on them to put them on our fishing line. And I'm sure I got like lead in my teeth. I'm sure I swallowed lead. It's a, it's a surprise that I'm not dumber than I am, tell you the truth. <laughs> um, but I think we, you know, we could do a lot of things to sort of encourage um, you know, people to, to protect more of our, our natural world and especially condors, such a, a majestic and 
uh, species and, and magnificent um, and tough birds overall. So, uh, Joe, thanks so much uh, for joining me today. It's been great to talk with you and thanks for sharing your knowledge uh, about lead and condors. Hey, thank you so much for having me. I look forward to our next chat. Condors aren't purposefully exposing themselves to lead. It's just that we're not giving them much of a choice. Alternatives to lead ammunition and fishing tackle are widely available, so let's make the effort to use them. It helps condors and people and myriad other species. Condor populations may have a long way to go before they can be considered fully recovered, but they can get there if we remain committed to protecting them and making sure that they are not exposed to poisons like lead. I'd like to thank Dr. Burnett again for joining me. To learn more about the work of the Ventana Wildlife Society, please go to their website. That is ventanaws.org and watch the condors at explore.org slash condors. We did have several questions come in about condors while we were talking or airing the, the interview uh, with Joe. And I'll try to uh, get through these quickly because we're getting towards the end of our conclusion of our, our, our live broadcast today. And I'd like to thank everybody who has submitted questions. A couple that I can answer real quickly here is just about uh, average lifespan and populations with condors. Condors can live a very long time, up to 60 years in the wild. So like a 20 year old bird is really just kind of getting started. Uh, their average lifespan is probably less than that, but they have uh, the ability to be some of the longest in the world. So yeah, uh, when you have a 20-year-old bird out there reproducing successfully, they still have maybe several decades of reproductive success ahead of them. And the current count of California condors in the wild and in captivity is a, is a little more than 500 birds at last uh, count, as far as I um, remember. Uh, somebody was wondering about the restoration and reintroduction with the Yurok tribe in Northern California. Are you working with them? I'm not. But uh, Joe is with the Ventana Wildlife Society. So again, if you wanted to learn more about that, you can head to their website and I think find some, some pretty good information uh, about that. Uh, one question came in about condor behavior, uh, wondering about Shadow and Traveler, who we focused on a lot during that interview. Somebody wrote in, is it normal that Shadow waited for Traveler? If there had not been a nest with a chick, would it have been more likely for Shadow to have found another mate. And that, I, I don't know. I don't know how long a condor will sort of wait. It might depend on whether there's sort of like a rival waiting in the wings to sort of like usurp that territory if there's a vacancy. We saw that happen with uh, Iniko, uh, who was that the, the chick we watched in the, uh, in the nest cam in the redwood tree in 2020. Uh, and then when the, that, the Dolan fire swept through that area uh, and the father of Iniko, uh, Kingpin died in that fire. So all of a sudden there's like a territorial vacancy and there was another uh, dominant condor that moved in almost immediately. So I think it might depend on whether there's some, somebody eyeballing uh, the territory or not. Maybe there just wasn't another female looking to, to move in on, on Shadow's territory, but that I don't know. I think that'd be a great question to ask uh, Joe in the future or if you join any of their, um, their uh, chat or webinars, I need to ask them. Uh, and regarding the surgery uh, of Traveler, somebody is wondering uh, where was the lead located in the bird's body? Uh, Traveler had ingested the lead, so it was in their stomach. It was it was in her uh, digestive tract at the time. So she, they had to go in and, and physically um, remove that lead from them, uh, or from her. Excuse me. Uh, surgery isn't the only option, though, for uh, removing lead from the bodies of condors. There is a, a, a chelation therapy for them. And somebody was wondering about that too. Is there a form of that type of therapy for condors? And yes, thankfully there is, uh, I believe so. And I think that when they're able to treat minor cases of lead poisoning or, or let, I shouldn't say minor, but less severe cases of lead poisoning in California condors, uh, biologists can use uh, that type of, of therapy. Uh, and then finally, one last question here I'll answer about condors uh, before we conclude today. Uh, uh, a person wrote in, I know have been banned from use in hunting waterfowl. Are, are there ongoing efforts to ban them completely? And nationwide, I know that uh, there's, there's no ban on, on lead bullets uh, in hunting, uh, whether that's like ter hunting terrestrial animals 
like deer, for instance, or whether that's um, they are banned for waterfowl hunting, though, nationwide. So that is that is federal law, but it's not federal law that um, that you must use an alternative to lead ammunition when you're hunting a deer or whatever else, for example. But I know people are working towards that effort and I do support that effort. I know the Ventana Wildlife Society probably would. I don't want to put words in their mouth, but them, the Institute for Wildlife Studies, you know, they work with um, eagles that have experienced lead poisoning. And then also our partners uh, with the Coroness in Iowa, the Raptor Resource Project. They do a lot of work to advocate for alternatives to lead ammunition um, in hunting to, for that, for the sake of the birds that we love and, and all the other wildfire wildlife that we share our communities with. So, yeah, I think that's a, a worthwhile effort and we should definitely do so. But currently right now there is no, um, no ban on lead ammunition for, for hunting, um, nationwide. And I'd like to thank everybody for their questions. I want to thank our guests again for uh, taking the time to uh, join us uh, and take the time out of their day to share their expertise. I learned so much from talking with our experts about the animals that we see on our cameras and some of the ways that we can help them, those animals, become more successful and more populous as we work towards, uh, you know, again, sharing the world with the amazing wildlife that has evolved to live here along, alongside us. Uh, you know, lead poisoning, it's not exclusive to California condor, and nor is uh, DDE, DDT contamination exclusive to bald eagles. These species and many others experience problems from both. And the good news is we have solutions to alleviate, you know, these pollutants. So, uh, you know, we can make better choices now to reduce and eliminate pollution. Uh, you know, we can do a lot of other things to help wildlife and people around the world as well. We can accelerate the adoption of renewable energy. Uh, we can curb our consumption. We don't need to buy as much. We don't need to consume as much. We can empower local and indigenous communities with the ability to protect landscapes. And if we work to help protect and restore wildlife populations, even we can look at the work that Dr. Sharp has done with the Institute for Wildlife Studies. We can look at the work that Dr. Burnett has done with the Ventana Wildlife Society. And then our legacy, you know, if we work to protect uh, these animals, our legacy doesn't have to be one of mistakes. It can certainly be something that future generations thank us for. And these two bird, pot, bird species, the bald eagle and the California condor, they represent stories of hardship and hope uh, and success in an era of great human impact on the planet. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Mike Fitz with explore.org. Until we talk again, enjoy the cams and we'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.